Thank you for clicking on the channel. AOS. Similar sound doctrine channel. Similar sound doctrine. AOSD. RPK. Resurrection from the kingdom. Like, subscribe, share. Let's go. Uh -huh. Come get a lesson. I'm teaching blessings. No need for guessing. I'm knowledge testing. It's truth time. The wise will shine. And the wicked will pine. I'm a righteous kind. Break out of trouble, I'm keeping the subtle. Just me and my brothers and sisters. They love us. We're fixing the puzzle. No stress on our cousin. The buck of the struggle will answer the cuz. Wanna read it, believe it. It should be back. See that they need it. Like a kid back. Breaches and pieces. Like a kid cat. I ease it. I get seized. It's a poly world, not dolly world. Alpha love, the kingdom within. AOS key is for missing. RPK, let you gonna begin. It's a poly world, not dolly world. Alpha love, the kingdom within. AOS key is for missing. RPK, let you gonna begin. Shalom everyone, I hope y'all having a fantastic night tonight. Uh, this is your brother Elvin Israel Israel from the Assembly of Sound Doctrine Chandler. And what I will be going through tonight uh, is a breakdown on the Day of the Lord. Uh, I know there's a lot of different reactions to the Day of the Lord and whether or not we should flee uh, from this place to that place or whether or not this whole globe is going to be under tribulation and etc. So what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to try to actually explain using biblical resources as well as historical resources dealing with the Jews on what exactly the day of the Lord is and what's going on with it so we can either be at ease or flee so hopefully we we'll understand what we need to be doing in the 21st century when this is over with um, please if you have not uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel AOSD C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R and it stands for Assembly of Sound Doctrine Chandler. Once again, A-O-S-D, C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. It stands for Assembly of Sound Doctrine Chandler, where I have a plethora of videos that goes through and teach all kind of different information dealing with the uh, Israelites. So now, um, what we're going to go through first. We're going to look at some of the certain uh, instances where the days of the Lord has happened throughout the Bible. Uh, so... Let's get ready to get started right now. I know it's kind of late. Uh, this is not going to be a quick lesson. You know, these days of the Lord and these things like this, they take a while. So get your coffee, get your popcorn, uh, get you some food, and uh, relax because it's going to be a minute. It's going to be a sec. Okay, so first of all, I'm not going to go through all of the days of the Lord, but I'm just going to show you different instances. Okay, we have Obadiah. Um one right Obadiah one you have 15 for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen right as thou hast done shall it be done to thee thy reward shall return upon thine own head so uh, what we call here pretty much in the Western world as karma, a day of the Lord is more like karma. Whatever you have done wicked, it's going to be returned back upon you through destruction. Okay, we're going to give another example of the day of the Lord. Uh, we got Joel uh, 3, and we're going to go to, let's see here. Uh, render me a real comparison. Let's see which one of these is going to be. The, I'm sorry, uh, I had it out of my Septuagint, so it's, it reads a little bit different than what the Masoretic have. So I guess it's going to be in chapter two, right here. Two and one. Blow ye the trump, the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. And it's nigh his hand. A day. Now how did they uh, explain the day of the Lord? A day of darkness and gloominess. 
a day of clouds and thick darkness. So this is when Christ was saying, you know, uh, the moon should not get off her light. The stars should fall from heaven. All of that represents darkness, a uh, time of celestial darkness. Uh, we know that this is Hebraic literature, Hebraic language, which just represents uh, all devastation, in other words. So it's mental devastation because of what's going on throughout the land. So you got the day of the Lord here being... Uh, darkness pretty much what's going on a uh, army is coming in and as you keep reading uh in joel you see that the army is coming in uh they should run they should run like mighty men they should climb the wall like men of war um they should run to and fro in the city the earth shall quake the heaven shall tremble and etc all the hebraic uh, language for the day of the lord um i'm going to give you uh two more and then we're going to get ready to start on the lesson uh we got zechariah uh, 14 behold the day of the lord cometh and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee and this is one of the prophecies that they're telling you it's actually supposed to be happening today uh, indeed, indeed. Shalom, shalom, everybody. Uh, share the video, too. Like and share the video. Uh, but you see, uh, here they got the day of the Lord, right? Um, and they tell you that this is going to be the one that we're waiting, we're waiting on, right? This is the future devastation pretty much in our generation, our timeline, right? But here it says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. So whatever this day of the Lord is, it's looking toward Jerusalem, okay? So, but it's the day of the Lord, and what's happening in the day of the Lord? Once again, nations are coming against Jerusalem to battle, okay? The day of the Lord, battle, city taken, houses rifled, women ravished, half of the city going into captivity. Once again, the day of the Lord is dealing with a war. It's dealing with a battle, right? Always dealing with a battle, a battle. So now, you go into Malachi. This is the one that we are going to pretty much be familiar with. And this is the one that we're going to piggyback off of. Okay? So, we're going to go into Malachi 4 and 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, said the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And the first thing people do, right, they look at all of this Hebraic imagery, and they automatically assume that it's going to be great hellfire that's coming down from earth, it's going to, I mean from heaven, it's going to be divine, the whole earth. It's going to be burnt up and it's going to have to be replaced, right? But I'm here to uh, show y'all. Let's see if we can go to something right here, right? Let's go to Isaiah real fast. Isaiah 47 and 14. It says here, um, we can start at 1. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. So look, O daughter of the Chaldeans, thou shalt never be no more called the lady of kingdoms. So this is something going against the Chaldeans, right? Which will pretty much be dealing with Medo Persia coming in and destroying them. But look as it is as it's uh spoken of, right? Uh thou art weary in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly uh, prog what's that? prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Look what it says right here. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a cold to warm it nor fire to sit before it so when um the when the medes came in and destroyed babylon 
Did the whole earth catch on fire? All right? Did the whole globe catch on fire? Did the whole Babylon catch on fire? I mean, how could it if Daniel was part of that? Right? And that, why wasn't they all burnt up? So you see this imagery, this language, right? Them being burnt by fire. They're going to be at stubble. Okay, so now we see the similar language in Malachi. So now let's go back to Malachi. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. So it's the same exact thing. So you got to think about it's the same type of judgment that Babylon uh, received. Same type of judgment. It's not a, a, a particular burning of the whole universe how people want it, right? And the day that cometh shall burn them up said the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But I want y'all to notice who's being destroyed here. The proud. So this, this day of the Lord is going against the proud and all that do wickedly. So this is the uh, who the day of the Lord is affecting. The proud and those that do wickedly, right? So then, once you go down to verse number five, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and uh, dreadful day of the Lord, right? So we have a promise that Elijah was going to come before the great day of the Lord. So now, once we go to Uh, hold on. Once we go to Matthew 11 and 14, well, we're going to start at 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John. So now, once you get to John the Baptist, all the prophets and the law prophesied until, till, got you up until John. Once again, all the law and the prophets got you up until John. Why? And if you receive it, this is Elias or Elijah from the Hebraic uh uh, translation into English, which is which was for to come. So now, John the Baptist was Elias or Elijah, right? Elias Greek to English, Elijah Hebrew to English. So now, let's go back into Malachi once again and see what's going to happen. Behold, I will send you Elijah. So when you see Elijah here, think of John the Baptist, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the father lest I come and smite the earth with a curse so now you see Elijah was going to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord there's no more days of the Lord past Elijah okay once you go through the prophets and how the things set up there's no prophecy about destruction past Elijah's generation. Once again, there's no prophetic uh, things of destruction past when Elijah came. When Elijah comes, he was going to bring forth uh, the, the day of the Lord. No more day of the Lord past Elijah. So according to Christ, Elijah was John the Baptist. So we can't look past John the Baptist because the law and the prophets prophesied up until John the Baptist. So we can't look past John the Baptist in his generation for anything future. We can't go past John the Baptist's generation for the day of the Lord. So now let's look at John the Baptist's message real fast. Okay, we're going to go to John the Baptist's message. We're going to go to... Uh, Matthew 3 uh, we're going to read 7 and 10 and how you know this is John the Baptist it says it right here 3 and 1 and in those days came John the Baptist aka Elijah 
preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, what was his message? Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist came with a message. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's so near, it's at hand. Once again, if you guys don't understand how at hand work, I want everybody to go in your kitchen, pick up a spoon, drop it on the floor, and then pick it up. That process of you picking up your spoon is at hand. So that's how soon they're looking for dealing with things. So um, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. So now, once you go to verse 7, look at what John the Baptist's message was. And while and where he was baptizing people in Jordan, telling them to repent. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, who is he speaking to? The Pharisees and Sadducees of the first century. He said unto them, O generation of vipers, generation, that's the same generation he lived in, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you, 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 the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, to flee from the wrath to come. Now, what wrath to come was John the Baptist talking about? Once again, you go into Malachi chapter 4. I will send Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the wrath that he had to be talking about was the day of the Lord, which he had to come before the prophet, before the coming in great and dreadful day of the Lord. So you got John the Baptist being Elijah saying that you Pharisees and Sadducees, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, who was the wrath coming upon? The proud and all that do wickedly once again the proud and all that do wickedly who did john the baptist address the pharisees and the sadducees so he's telling them that they are the recipients of the wrath here in malachi they were called the proud and wicked uh, matthew actually explains who they are the proud and wicked was going to be the pharisees and sadducees right so who was going to flee them from the wrath to come, right? Verse number 10. Oh, well, I'm going to read all of them. 8 through 10. Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So that lineage by bloodline, was it going to save them from the wrath? What was going to save them? Fruits for meat for sorry, fruits meat for repentance. So repentance was going to save them from the wrath, not no being Abraham's uh, bloodline. So now, verse ten, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruits is hewn down and cast into the fire. And you see that allegorical when um, Christ passed the, the, the fig tree. Even though it wasn't the season pretty much for the figs, it didn't bring forth good fruit. So he cursed it and it withered away. So now, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. So I don't know if you know anything about how cutting down trees work with axes. But anybody, when you get free time, do not hurt yourself. Go get an axe, right? Hold the axe and put it to the root of the tree, right? That was how close the day of the Lord was through John the Baptist's message. And he said, therefore, every tree. So now, who was he calling the trees here, right? First, he told the Pharisees and the Sadducees they need to have fruit. So look at the imagery on how they're he's using agriculture. They need to have fruits 
or they're going to be destroyed from the wrath. Now he's saying the axe is laid on the root of the trees and every tree which bring forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So he's using that agricultural means of that society that they was in to explain to them that they were not producing the things they were supposed to be producing, being the children of the Most High, being the sons of God, being the ones that's in covenant, since they wasn't bringing forth that true fruit, they were going to be cast away and thrown into the fire. I mean, we can't get away with it. That's just the message, right? So then uh, I want to piggyback off of that. I want to go to uh, Matthew 21. And I want to start at verse 33, dealing with the parable, right? Dealing with the parable. And this parable is going to explain the same message that John the Baptist had, dealing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the southern kingdom at this time. Matthew 21, 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. So look at more of the imagery dealing with the agricultural, the agrarian society that they lived in and whatever. And hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and led it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So in other words, he created and he left. He created and left. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. So hopefully you understand this is what's going through uh, the life of Israel right now, right? So he left Israel to be the priest of the earth. They were supposed to bring forth good fruit, good worship unto him, peace and love and all of that stuff unto the Most High so his creation could be in its perfect sense, right? But they did not. In fact, what Israel did, they took the the uh the prophets they killed them they killed the prophets right so now we we here verse 36 again he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise but last of all he sent unto them his son saying they will reverence my son so in other words let me catch up what's going on here now i don't know how everybody feels about the deity of christ i'm not here to adhere to your personal feelings about the deity of christ i'm not going to do that i'm going to tell you what i get from my studies and what the spirit tells me so now this is what we're going to do with the deity of christ so you got the father sending all of these prophets in order to benefit his son's work, his son's kingdom, right? The father's calling the shots. The word is doing what the father say do. So the word had all these prophets come uh, from Israel to teach Israel how to be uh, do the correct means that they're supposed to do so they can actually minister to the earth, which they did not do. They killed prophet up on top of prophet. So now the father said, okay, well, since they are doing that to mere men, I'm going to send my son, a.k.a. the word, a.k.a. the creator of all of them, a.k.a. their God, their almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. I'm going to send him down since he has the inheritance anyway. I'm going to send him down and maybe they will listen to him. Since he's their God and everything, he did the creation. He the one that did the talking to the prophets for them. He was the word in the beginning. I'm going to send him down. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. So somehow they was going to get the kingdom of heaven through their means, through their evil deed, their, their evil deeds, right? And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. So they slew the Christ, right? When the Lord, therefore, the vineyard cometh, 
when the Father, now it's time to rectify, when the Father cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, now listen to their answer, right? This is their answer. They say unto him, he will, let me make sure I got good volume. Okay, okay, I got good volume. He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Ain't that what John the Baptist told them? They had to bring forth good fruits who had uh, warned them of the wrath to come. So this parable is directly John the Baptist's message to the Pharisees and Sadducees. So now let's keep going. Verse 42. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes therefore say I unto you the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof so now what he just did what Christ just did with this parable he just made a distinction between national Israel and spiritual Israel. That's what he just did right here. He made a distinction between national Israel and spiritual Israel. He didn't tell them, hey, national Israel, I'm going to take the kingdom from you, national bloodline Israelites, and give it to you, national bloodline Israelites. That, that didn't make sense. That don't make sense. That's not what he said. He's going to take the kingdom from them, the sons of God, the ones who were supposed to inherit all coming out of Egypt, he's going to take the kingdom from them and give it to a nation, a new people, bringing forth fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. That takes you back to Daniel chapter 2 with the statue and the stone. And when the stone hit the statue, it busted the statue into dust, into like the chaff, and it blew. So whoever fall on this stone, and later on we find that that stone became a great mountain, a.k.a. the heavenly Jerusalem. But on whosoever it fall, it would grind him to powder. So look how the, the Israelites or the priests responded. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, not just one, all of them, heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. You can't be killing on the prophets now, not, not in ancient Israel. No, those uh, poor men were going to destroy you. But now, look what's going to be here. The, the, um, they said themselves that the husbandmen would destroy those wicked men. This is what we call the day of the Lord. So they answered their own self. This is the day of the Lord right here that they're speaking about. The husbandman was going to destroy those wicked men, right? So that's the day of the Lord. And then I want to look at 2 Corinthians 1. I want to read 13 through 14. For we write none other things unto you than what you read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, as also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as you are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So now we have the day of the Lord Jesus being introduced. Once again, we got the day of the Lord Jesus being introduced. So notice, it went from the day of the Lord to the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, are you going to make a distinction and say there's a difference between the day of the Lord and the day of the Lord Jesus? These are different means. If you're going to do that, hopefully we're going to uh, actually explain how these are the same exact day. The day of the Lord is the day of the Lord Jesus, or the day of the Messiah. That's what we're going to do, but let's keep going. Uh, notice he said right here, 
For we write none other things unto you than what you read or acknowledge, and I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end, right? Even to the end. Let's see what the word end right there is. The end is teos, a uh, definite part of goal properly to point, the point aimed at as a limit. In other words, the limit. To the end or the point of a limit. Okay, so now. We're going to just put that G5056. I'm, I don't know if it's going to pop up again, but if it does, we're going to see. So now, let's look at more things about this day of the Lord. We're going to go through, uh, we're going to go to Matthew. Let me, let me quiet that down a little bit. We're going to go to Matthew 24. And we're going to start reading, well, I, I probably shouldn't start at Matthew 24, right? I should probably start at Matthew 23. Matthew 23, right? Then Jesus spoke, then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, right? So this is going against the scribes of the Pharisees in the first century, right? So now, and he's going to go through the whole history of the scribes and Pharisees. But he's actually speaking to those in the first century. How do you know? He says right here, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. And he's doing all of these woes and to the scribes and Pharisees. So now, in the first century, who did John the Baptist uh, talk that was going to get destroyed? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? Now, in the parable, who did Christ say was going to be uh, destroyed and get the kingdom taken from them? The Pharisees, right? So now, we have here, once again, Christ is uh, speaking against the scribes and the Pharisees. It have not, the day of the Lord have not left that audience of the scribes and the Pharisees that lived in the first century. No matter how many people want it to be about today, right now, we have not left the first century. So we're going to see for, uh, later on if we're ever going to leave the first century. So now, it says, verse 30, and I say, and I say uh, let's see here, 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build up the tombs of the prophets, and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not, you see how now Christ is going to the antiquity. He's going to the their forefathers, their ancestors now. So he's making a distinction. This is how time works. He's in the first century, so now he's taking them back to the earlier uh, life of their ancestors who killed the prophets when you was reading them in the prophets and, and when uh, Jeremiah and all them, when, they, when those uh, ancient Israelites were killing the prophets. So he's going back to that. So it shows you that he's showing the time phrase, uh, the time range, right? And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers of the old, we uh, would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. So that was past tense. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. So that is present tense, first century. Fill up ye the measure of your fathers. He's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, right? Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Ain't that the same thing that John the Baptist called them? Those Pharisees and, Sa and Sadducees that came to him? Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So he's dooming them to hell. What is he? What is they talking about? Once again, this is all about the day of the Lord. John the Baptist gave them uh, the message that they were going to be the recipients of the day of the Lord. The parable told them they was going to be recipients of the day of the Lord. Now Christ is in front of them telling them that they are going to be the recipients to get the damnation of Sheol, of hell. And he's, he's going to explain to them even more. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you, first century, 
prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you shall kill and crucify, first century. And some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. This happened first century. You can find this out throughout the book of Acts. That upon you, who was the you? The people in America, 21st century? No, the people in Russia, the people in China, no, none of these people he's talking to in the 21st century, he's talking to the people in front of him. Upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon earth from the blood of righteous Abel, so he took them back to Genesis, unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. So this was a first century occurrence that they saw. It's actually spoken of in the book of Josephus also. But you have him telling that first century audience of Pharisees and scribes that all of the righteous blood shed upon earth from Abel to the first century he lived in. All of that blood was going to come upon them. So that is a day of the Lord's of day of the Lord's. There had not been one prophecy of the day of the Lord that everybody righteous was going to be taken, uh, was going to be avenged on that nation. This is the first time a prophecy about a destruction was about the righteousness of everybody that had ever existed was going to come upon the heads of one nation at one particular time. And Christ literally told them it was going to happen their generation. And let's keep saying, let me, let, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, let's keep reading. Verily I say unto you, he's talking to the scri scribes and Pharisees in front of him. All these things shall come upon this generation. So just in case you're saying I'm making it up, he's literally telling them that that day of the Lord is going to come upon their generation, not the generation of the people that reads it, no matter what time period you live in, he's talking about your generation. No, this is what happened when you read yourself in the story, not di directed to you. This was directed to the scribes and Pharisees. You are reading the dialogue between Christ and the scribes and the Pharisees. So when he's saying this, He's talking his present time, not the present time of anybody who pick up the book at any time. That's not how the Bible works. So we got to quit reading ourselves and stuff not about us. And we can't use, well, my brother, there's nothing new under the sun. That's not what nothing new. Under, first of all, nobody ever used that in prophecy. If you don't believe, list a verse in the chat where someone ever used nothing new under the sun in prophecy. You have the whole entire Bible. You got the whole entire Apocrypha. You got the, all the non-canonicals. Please show me where someone of Israelite descent used it like that. In context, Solomon was talking about the works of nature. He was talking about the wind blowing, the rivers flowing, the sun being bright. That's what he was talking about. There's no new works of nature, and people make it be about prophecy. That's not how it works. I'm sorry. That's not how it works, and nobody ever did it. That's some modern-day stuff. Nobody in the antiquity ever did that. But now, let's go to verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou killest the prophets. Who? Jerusalem, not America, America. Not America, America. Not Antarctica, Antarctica. <laughs> not uh, Russia, Russia. Not Europe, Europe. N no. Not Asia, Asia. No. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. That killeth the prophets. And stone is them which are sent unto thee. Sent unto America? Nope. Sent unto anybody in the 21st century? Nope. The prophets were sent unto Jerusalem. All throughout the history, when they was in the land of Canaan, prophets always were sent to them. How often would I have gathered thy children together? See, that is the gathering that people are looking for, right? They're gathering, they're saying, oh, well, we're going to be gathered in the future. We're going to be, we're going to be a great gathering in the future. Christ said how often, 
So he's speaking in a deity form. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings for protection, and ye would not. They would never be part of the gathering. They would never let him gather them. They would never adhere to the principles of the Torah and etc. in order to be gathered. So now, I'm going to read this and then I'm going to go to the next point. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So now, not only did he say that the day of the Lord, of the greatest day of the Lord that had ever existed, was going to come on their generation, he also is going to take out their only way that they have a relationship with the Father. So not only did he wipe, he said he was going to wipe them off, he was going to wipe their whole system of religion off. That's, that's what's going on here. So then it goes on into Matthew 24 now. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There should not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So this is a destruction of the temple, which was going to come when? At the day of of the Lord. Once again, this is a day of the Lord theme. So now, we're going to go to verse 3. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him probably saying, Tell us when shall these things be? What things? The destruction of the temple. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And people want this to be him physically coming down on earth because they get lost in the Hebraic literature and, and the Greek uh, uh, literature, they get lost in it, and they want it to be a coming on earth, not knowing that the disciples is quoting from the book of Daniel dealing with the day of the Lord, and according to Daniel 17, his coming, as, as well as Ma uh, Malachi, in fact, I, I'm just going to show you real fast, uh, what shall be the sign of thy coming presence? And of the end of the world, and this is what the Greek people did. They put the word world there. That's why people think the world is going to end. But once you look up the Greek word there, it's aeon. I know y'all heard the saying, the, sorry, the saying, the saying from aeon to aeon. Aeon is just a time period, right? And here it says a messianic period, but it just means an age. The word world uh, dealing with the universe and stuff, dealing with the planet, is cosmos. This is what the Greek translators did. Uh, what's well, so are the English translators from the Greek? They put the word world there, and you guys think it's a cosmos. It's talking about the planet, which it is not. It's just talking about a specific time period, a specific age. Sorry about that. Hold on, y'all. I oh Lord. Hey, we, all right, all right, all right, hold on, my, God, my bad, y'all, I thought I had that cut down, so now, the end of the age, right, so now, his coming, right, what will be the sign of thy coming, right, I'm just going to show you this real fast, the sign of thy coming, you go to Daniel, Daniel 7, 13, and I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. So his coming, according to Daniel, he was going into the throne room in order to get, and there was giving him dominion and glory in the kingdom. So he was going to get a kingdom. So that's in Daniel. He wasn't coming to earth. He was coming into the throne to get his kingdom, the throne room. And you can see this same thing in Malachi. Let's go to Malachi real fast. And we're going to go right back to Matthew. Malachi 3. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord to show you that the Christ was here. He was the recipient. He was the one speaking here. The word, not the father, but anyway, behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. He prepared the way before Christ and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. 
even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. So we see from Daniel, he was going into the temple room. And in Malachi, he was going into the temple room. So his coming was him going into the temple room in order for him to get his kingdom. He was never coming to planet Earth. This is what people do with the Bible. They, they make a coming, be on planet Earth and all that other stuff. But now, in the end of the world or age, right? So now we're going to go to uh, verse 7. In the day of the Lord, right? Because this is all about the day of the Lord, the destruction, what's going to happen? Nation shall rise against nation. That's your war. Kingdom against kingdom. That's the war. There should be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Um, what do you say? But the end is not yet. Um, Haitian nation might but to be finished. And many false prophets arise. He that endure to the end shall be saved. That's not it though. Right here, uh, verse six. And you should hear wars and rumors of war. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So these wars and rumors of wars, the disciples had to hear, right? So the end, that's the same word right there, you see? That's the same end that Paul was talking about. The same G5056. But the end, that limit, that time limit had not come yet the end of that limit no more limitations out to that right but he says right here verse 13 but he that endure unto the end that time limit the same shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world that's uh Economy. You see the word world there is not the same world above. The word world there is not cosmos either. For a witness, so that's not saying that everybody on the planet had to get the gospel. That's not what it's saying at all. Everybody that was in that specific land, you see it right there, it means land that is of the globe, specifically the Roman Empire. See, it literally tells you that right there. So everybody within the Roman Empire, which is where Paul went with the gospel, for a witness unto all nations, those nations within the Roman Empire, and then shall the end, it's the end right there again, come, right? So, and Daniel actually tells you the time limit that was going to happen. Uh, Daniel 12 tells you, uh, let's go, let's show you real fast, and then we're going to pop right back in here. Daniel 12 tells you that, what's it at? From the, day, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make desolate set up, there should be 1,290 days. But blessed is he that waited and come to 1,330, in other words, 35 days, 5 and 30 days. So he told you the time period between the abominations of desolation set up and the end. See right here? But go thy way till the end be for they shall rest and stand and thou lie at the end of the days. What days? The 1,335 days. Not the end of the planet Earth. Not 2,000 years in the future. He literally tell, told them when they saw the abomination of desolation being set up, they only had 1,335 days at the most for this all to be wrapped up. And this is what Christ do in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, uh, starting at 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever read it, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So this is the day of the Lord getting ready to come. He told them when they see the abomination of desolation set up to flee into the mountains. Why? Because they only had 1,335 days to survive in order for this to be completely fulfilled. I'm sorry that they told y'all that it's all about our future and you're supposed to go into uh, some other land and flee right now and America's Babylon and all that other stuff. That's not the Bible's fault. There's just miscommunication from people not knowing scripture. But anyway, let's keep reading. Let him which is on the housetop 
not come down to take anything out of the house. So this is the Roman army getting ready to come in, a.k.a. the day of the Lord. This is the, the day of the Lord happening, right? Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child and to them to give suck in those days. But pray that your, that, uh, that your flight be not in the winter or neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time no nor ever shall be. So this is all about the Roman army coming in to destroy Jerusalem. Right? So now let's look at the parallel. You go to Luke 17. Luke 17 verse 30. Well, we're going to, uh, verse 28. Likewise also, and it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, why? You remember when, Sot, when, when Lot went out of Sodom, then Sodom was destroyed. He, do, he told them to flee into the mountains. Once they fled into the mountains, once they left out of Judea, then Judea was destroyed, along with Jerusalem, which is inside of Judea. So just like Lot, the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, when Lot went out, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. The, the uh, spiritual Sodom, which was Jerusalem, when those uh, chosen ones that followed Christ, when they left out of um, spiritual Sodom, which was Jerusalem, Jerusalem was destroyed, as well as the territories, all this stuff in Judea. And look what he said, verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So now he's going to tell, you know, that second coming that everybody said he's coming down to earth and stuff. He's telling them when the son of man, a.k.a. him, was going to be revealed. Here it tells it right here, verse 31. In that day, which he shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return. He said that, right? That's the same thing that Matthew said about Jerusalem being destroyed by the Roman army. Luke is saying it a different way. Luke, uh, he was more of a Grecian mind. Matthew, more of the Hebraic mind. They're saying the same thing, just using different literature, using their different mindset. Same concept, same principle, just saying it different ways. Now, remember Lot's wife. Uh, I'm going to go down to 37. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, in that night, that will be the, the day of the Lord, there shall be two men in one bed, one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered him and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Sorry, y'all. I don't know why I keep getting... Sorry, y'all. I don't know why I keep getting notifications. I might turn my phone off. I keep getting them. But they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. So... These people that's left, right? One taken, one left. These ain't the... He told the other people to flee into the mountains. So these people that's being taken and left, these are the, the uh, results of the uh, war. Just like in Babylon. Once you go into Babylon, uh, the, the history of Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar did the two uh, expeditions against uh, uh, Jerusalem, at one time, the first time, he left some of the Israelites, and then or the, the southern kingdom, the first time, and then he came back the second time and got the rest of the ones he left. So during the war, some was going to be taken, the other was going to be uh, left, all uh, because of the war. These ain't the people that fled into the mountains, okay? So now, uh, let's go. This is more about the day of the Lord now. So we're trying to get, put a time limit on the day of the Lord. So let's look at more time, the time references dealing with the day of the Lord. You go to 2 Peter. We're going to go to 2 Peter 3. 
we're going to read 7 through 10. But the heavens and, and the earth, which are now, and we done did plenty breakdowns on my personal channel as well as RPK channel about what the heavens and earth is. It's not about the sky and the ground. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So once again, this is the same thing that Malachi said. The proud and those that did wicked was going to be the ones burnt up. Now you got Peter telling them the, the ones burnt up in the day of judgment is the ungodly people. Not the godly people. Only the ungodly people were going to be burnt up, right? So now, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And people, you look at that and say, Well, my brother, that means one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So no, that's not what it's saying. It's a, it's a comparison. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. He didn't say one day is a thousand years. He didn't say that. So now, anyway, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but they all should come to repentance. So the reason why in the first century he was prolonging his judgment was because he wanted as many people as could to repent. That's the same message that John the Baptist had. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord, so we got it right there. The day of the Lord, what are they talking about? The day of the Lord. All of the day of the Lord is dealt with what? Armies dealt with war. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heaven shall pass away with the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. So, uh, you got the day of the Lord right here, right? So we got the day of the Lord introduced right here that was going to burn up everything. This is the message that Peter was teaching. This is the message that Paul was teaching. This is the message Christ was teaching. They was all teaching about the day of the Lord, that destruction. The gospel pertained the day of the Lord, that destruction. So now, and I'm going to do a class on that by itself, the gospel. But Revelation 16 now, and 15 through 16. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. So this is Christ's words right here, right? So Christ said he comes as a thief. We just read Peter said the day of the Lord comes as a thief. Now Christ is saying that he's coming as a thief, which means this is what Peter, or sorry, what Paul called the day of the Lord Jesus. It's the same thing. The day of the Lord is dealing with the judgment of Christ. This is why Christ was able to pronounce judgment to the Pharisees and scribes. This is his judgment. The day of the Lord is the day of Christ. So now, and he gathered them, and look what's going on right here. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This is what everybody talking about. The battle of Armageddon, but when you look at the word Armageddon right there, right? That is Armageddon, a.k.a. Marmageddon, symbolic name, Armageddon, but it's the Valley of Megiddo, which is in the Old Testament where they did most of their fighting at, uh, the Valley of Megiddo. So Armageddon is just a, uh, the war in Megiddo. So now, we see that this is the same thing. Christ is coming with wrath, with the day of the Lord, to destroy those wicked and ungodly men, right? So now, you also see that in Revelation 6 and 17, uh, well, 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Follow us and hide us from the face of him that set it on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, 
and who is able to stand. Is this not the, this is the same message, isn't it, that John the Baptist had to the Pharisees and Sadducees in the first century? Who has uh, uh, told you to flee from the wrath? to come he's talking to the pharisees and the sadducees in the first century christ also said it in the parable he also told the disciples of the temple being destroyed peter also told those wicked people or uh, the people that he was addressing that the great day of the lord was getting ready to come so now we have it in revelation again speaking of the great day of the wrath which all was not was it didn't go past first century right so now, let me keep showing you even more, right? So we're going to go to Jude. Go to Jude 14 and 15. And Enoch, also the seven from Adam, and we can find this in the book of Enoch, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord come with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. This is what happened inside of um, the wilderness, right? All of these characteristics is why the people got killed inside of the wilderness when they received that old covenant. So this is the what, the people being destroyed upon them bringing in the new covenant. And their mouth speak a great swelling words, having men's person and admiration because of advantage. So these were respecter of men. They were murmurous complainers walking after their own lust. And these were who he called ungodly, who had ungodly deeds. They had ungodly committed and they had hard speeches which were ungodly sinners that spoken against the Lord, right? And we're going to show you all of this being displayed in just a second. So, the day of the Lord, right here again, Enoch, when Enoch prophesied this, behold, the Lord cometh, who was coming? Christ, with 10,000 of his saints. Remember, this is to execute judgment. So this is a judgment. This ain't him coming to earth. This is a judgment which represents him being the high authority. And that judgment is symbolic to him, his will come, or sorry, him bringing an army to earth per se. This is just how the ancients thought. But the old prophets actually explain how this looks. But now, let's give you more of the time period. So he's coming to execute judgment, right? So let's give you more of the time period. Matthew 16, 27 through 28. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. This is the same thing that Jews said. And then shall reward every man according to his works. This is what Jews said. Verily I say unto you, who was the you he's talking to? Verse 24, then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here in front of him, not the people reading thousands of years in the future or whenever he comes back, the people standing in front of him. That's not, no, he's talking to, the, to his audience, which was the disciples. There be some standing here, which shall not taste of death, that's, Let's see what the word death there is. Should not taste of death. Death. Um, that autos, that autos, which is death. Uh, real, literal, or figurative. So this will be a literal death here. Which should not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So he didn't tell them that they wasn't going to die. That's not what he said. He said they weren't going to die until... They see the Son of Man set in his kingdom. So either he lied to them and or they're somewhere on planet Earth uh, and they changed their identity because they're still waiting on him. Or he did exactly what he was said he was going to do. And while they were living, some of those in front of him was able to see his judgment come, his day of the Lord come. Right? So now, everybody, you can take a pause. 
Go get your coffee. Uh, go get your get your popcorn. Cause now we finna really hit it. Now we finna actually go into a little more scripture, and then we finna go into some history to back some of this stuff up. So here we go. We're gonna go to First Peter. First Peter 4, we're going to read 16 and 17. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come, for the time, and we see is come was added, right? For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Is that not the same thing that Christ told them? The uh, the the Pharisees and scribes, your house is left unto you desolate. Then he come out the temple. He tell the, the, the uh, disciples, the temple will be destroyed. So now you have Peter telling them, for the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, so the judgment is going to begin at the us. Who was the us? The people in Jerusalem in the first century. And if judgment first, first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel? So does it look like Peter was trying to talk to people thousands of years in the future about the day of the Lord, about are the people standing in front of him? Well, if you choose people thousand years in the future or nothing new under the sun, you are absolutely incorrect. So now let's back it up. Let's show in John, 1 John, right? So we go to 1 John 2. 1 John 2, we're going to read 18. Look what John say. Little children. It is the last time. Let's look at the word time real fast. Time, which is aura. That's where we get the word hour from in English. And you see it right there. It actually says hour. Literally or frequently. A day, hour, instant, season, short, or tide. And they use tide a lot, you know, evening tide and all that stuff. So this is the last time or the New King James Version use, actually used the word hour. So listen to what John is saying. John is saying, little children, it is the last hour. Oh, sorry about that. It is the last hour. As you... And as ye, who is the ye, the ones he's talking to in the first century, have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. So he said the, the requirement for the Antichrist has been met. In fact, it has been overly met. It has been overly achieved. Now there are many Antichrists. They was looking just for one Antichrist. He said that has been met and it has been uh, um, uh, multiplied and there are many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last hour so he said remember they said uh, Paul taught uh, first there had to be the son of perdition had to come and the mystery of iniquity does already work to show that that was happening in the first century but John actually let it be known that antichrist he's looking around in the first century and he's looking for the signs right because this sign came from christ we're gonna um let's show you right here this sign came straight from christ uh matthew 24 you remember they asked him uh when shall these things be what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age right and what was one of the things that christ told them and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many what else did he say for if there for there shall arise false christ that's your antichrist right there and hold on where, what just happened here what did i just click on sorry about that y'all i don't know what i did 
Well, whatever it did, I highlighted all of it. So, so now, anyway, uh, so we're at verse number 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall, grow, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would uh, deceive the very elect. Let me scroll over all that and take that off. I guess I can never take it off. Sorry about that, y'all. Give me one second. I can't have it. Okay, there we go. Let me get back to it. There. All right. Sorry. I had it. It's for future reference, y'all. I can't see that. For there shall arise false Christ. So that was one of the signs that dealt with the end of the age. Antichrist, false Christ, Antichrist was a sign. See, um, when will uh, tell us when shall these things be in the sign of thy coming of the end of the age? So one of the signs were the false Christ with an S. Many Antichrist. See, false Christ with an S. So now you have John saying here. What was it? First uh, John three, and let me get it back. I'm uh, sorry, First John 2, that's the problem, 18. Little children, it is the last time, hour, as, as many, as ye have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last hour. So now they're all saying this is the last hour before the day of the Lord approach, or the day of the Lord come. So then you can go back to uh, Romans 13, 11, and 12, and that knowing the time, knowing the what? The time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, that's the resurrection, for now is our salvation nearer than we believe. So that salvation that came through the day of the Lord was nearer then they believe the night is forspent. The day is at hand. So now the day of the Lord was at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So you see how they're all saying the same thing in the first century? That that day of the Lord was going to come. Right? The day of the Lord was going to come. So now... We're gonna go. We're gonna uh, venture off a little bit. We're gonna venture off a little bit, and now we're gonna go back and forth. Now, let's go through some history. Now, no, not that one. Not. Let's go through some history. Now, we're gonna go to War of the Jews, right? Josephus, the historian. He's a Jew historian. Oh right, y'all, hold on. Let me go cut my uh, let me go cut my air off. Give me one second. Everybody, take two minutes to go get your coffee and your popcorn or whatever. I'm gonna go cut the air off. All right, probably wasn't two minutes. Definitely wasn't two minutes. But uh, I'm back now. If uh, this is a this is a recording, so if anybody missed, they always can rewind it. So now, I'll, I'll play it back later. So we're gonna go to this great war that Christ was speaking on, right? And how do we know it's a war? I guess I better show y'all that real fast. Uh, you go to. Let me see here. Let's go to, and I'm going to touch back on this scripture later on, but let me touch it real fast. You go to Matthew 24, right? 24, 15. 
Will you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place? Whosoever read it, let him understand. Then let those which be in Judea flee to the mountains, right? And then you see the correlation in Luke. Luke 21, verse number 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. So, Matthew, Matthew says the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel flee into the mountains. Um, Luke says when you see the army that caused desolation flee into the uh, mountains. And how do you know it's an a, a army also? You go into Daniel chapter 9 dealing with another things about the abomination of desolation. He says it right here, Daniel 9, 26. Um, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So that's the day of the Lord right there. They're, they're pu uh, pulling this from Daniel. And see right here, Daniel 9, 27. The overspreading of abominations, he make it desolate. So this is all about a war. And they always looking for the war, this final war that was supposed to end all of the prophecies uh, and that old covenant bringing in an everlasting new covenant. So now, Let's finally go to what caused this war that the Messiah, uh, dealing with the Messiah's judgment, right? This is all about the Messiah's judgment, but we're going to read now. We're going to go into a little of history, what caused this war. So we got the War of the Jews, or History of the Destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, we're going to go to Book Two, containing the interval of 69 years from the death of Herod to Vespasian was sent to subdue the Jews by Nero. So we're going to go to chapter 17. How the war of the Jews with the Romans began and concerning uh, Manahem. So now a lot of people don't even know how the war of the Jews actually begun. And we know that this is the day of the Lord. This is the judgment by Christ. But for every uh, action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So even though this was a judgment by the word, things on the earthly realm had to play out in order for the judgment to be enacted. Once again, things had to play out on the, in the Roman Empire on planet Earth in order for the judgment to be enacted. So we're just going to read in the details of what actually happened for the judgment to be enacted. So now uh, we're going to go to, this is book 17, section 2. And oh, I got here, what, 408 to 14. So let me find it real fast. I got my heart back here. Okay, so we're going to start it right here. I guess I can read uh, the whole thing. Uh, let's get my highlighter real fast. All right. And at this time, it was that some of those that principally excited the people to go to war made an assault upon a certain fortress called Masada. They took it by treachery and slew the Romans that were there and put others of their own party to keep it. At the same time, Eleazar, the son of Ananias, the high priest, a very bold youth who was at that time governor of the temple, persuaded those that officiated in the divine service to receive no gift or sac sacrifice from any foreigner. At this, and this was the true beginning of our war with the Romans. For they rejected the sacrifice of Caesar on this account. And when many of the high priests and principal men besought them not to omit the sacrifice, which it was customary for them to offer for their princes, 
they would not prevail upon. They would not be prevailed upon. So first of all, did y'all know that the uh, the Gentiles were having sending sacrifices to the temples? Did y'all even know that? Once again, did y'all know? Y'all know Israel only. It was only about Israel. Was Israel, Israel, Israel. Did y'all know that the Gentiles was actually sending sacrifices to the temple? Did y'all know that? Okay, so now let's uh we're gonna read uh section let's see here two book two chapter nineteen now. We're gonna go to chapter nineteen. So that's what started the war. They didn't want to. Uh, it was all about the service of the Most High. I oh, sorry. The, yeah, the service of the Most High, and you see how the word reacted to them not giving the Father the due sacrifices. Once again, the Jews would not accept sacrifices that were supposed to be given to the father so you see how the word enacted his judgment perfect timing the jews keep doing it to themselves so perfect timing right so now we're going to look at let's go back to scripture now so now we're going to show y'all how the bible and the history lines up right dealing with the day of the lord this final day of the lord so you got matthew 24 15 right when you therefore shall see an uh, abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet standing in the holy place whosoever read it let him understand then let those which be in judea flee into the mountains right and we read in luke 21 that this is actually about the roman army right or an army when you should see jerusalem compassed with armies then know the desolation thereof is nigh then let them which are in judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let them not that are in the countries enter there into so now how do when judea when those in judea see it right when uh jerusalem uh, compassed with armies they are supposed to flee but how do the ones in Jerusalem, how do they get out? Because the city is already encompassed with armies. So the big question is, how are they supposed to get out? And I know they want you guys to believe once again that this is about today's time and this is going to happen in our future, which is a bunch of malarkey. It's because they don't understand the history behind the Jews. Therefore, they make it be about us because they don't know history. So we're going to show you once again the historical setting to show you that all of this stuff has already passed. The fleeing into the mountains and etc. So while people are moving to Africa and these other places, they're doing it for no reason because the great day of the Lord that they're talking that's going to happen had already happened first century and now we are proving that we should be at ease and we should not flee because we're reading fulfilled prophecies already it wasn't fulfilled in the time that it was written that's why it was written in future tense saying that it was going to happen in the future but we have it 2,000 years later, so it's our past, but it was their future. So you're trying to read it from your future perspective because you're reading nouns, well, you're reading verbs in future tense. Of course it was future tense to them because it, it haven't happened yet, but it's not future tense to us. It sh we should read it more in past tense. But now, uh, that's a long thing. So now we see them fleeing into the mountains, right? And then we can see the same thing in the book of Revelation. You go to Revelation 12, right? Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, which is, this will be the second exodus, uh, where she had a place prepared of God. And they shall feed her a thousand two hundred and three scores. It's that not the same thing that Daniel said, right? We, we're going to go there uh, pretty much in just a second. I think he said uh, 2090, something like that. But anyway, well, he might have said 60. We're going to look at it. And then uh, Revelation 12 and 14. 
and the and to the woman were given wings, two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place, where she should be nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. Right? So this is them, aka fleeing into the mountain from the Roman army. And I think this in Daniel twelve two. Let's see, twelve um yeah, because here it says 1,290 days. The other one is 1,260 days. So it was supposed to be for a time, times, and a half, right? So that is Daniel ooh, 9. Let's see if it's 9. Uh, no, nah, that's not 9. Definitely not 9. Uh, let's see about the times, times, and a half take away well that's the abomination of desolation being taken away right there i mean being placed up in daniel 11 that's the end of the time what the time times and a half time in in daniel Let's see seven is the prophecy uh that's nope five that's the meats being coming in six it's somewhere here in Daniel. I know it is. I ain't going to keep going and wasting it. I thought it was like around Daniel 12, though. Maybe I just don't got to highlight it. Yeah, here we go right here. So it was Daniel 12. Uh, and I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, and he held up his right hand, and he left in his left hand up to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. See right there? And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things should have, shall be finished. That is the war right there. That's the war of the Romans. This is the day of the Lord. He's scattering the power of the holy people. He's destroying their temple. He's ending their covenant, uh, that old covenant. And that was going to be how long? For a time, times and a half. So this is the time where they are getting ready to flee into the mountains, what we have just read in Revelation 12. So now, how did those inside of Jerusalem survive? Because by the time they saw the army, it was too late. So now we have history to actually explain it. Uh, verse 19, what Cestius did against the Jews and how upon besieging Jerusalem he retreated from the city without any just occasion in the world as also the severe calamities he went under from the Jews in his retreat. So now, uh, War, War of the Jews, book 2, section 19, I mean sorry, chapter 19, section 2. And let me get, go there actually inside of my hardcover but make sure so now look what it says right here but as for the Jews when they saw the war approaching to their metropolis so uh metropolis my bad Met metropolis this is what's going on right this is what's going on what Christ said when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies know that the desolation thereof is not but as for the Jews when they saw the war approaching for their metropolis uh, or metropolis, they left the feast and betook themselves to their arms and taking courage greatly from their multitude, went in a sudden and disorderly manner to the fight with a great noise and without any consideration had of the rest of the seventh day. So now they went to fight and they violated their Sabbath day it was during a feast i believe what feast is this tabernacles you're right here um, the whole multitude were gone up to jerusalem to the feast of tabernacles right yet he did destroy 50 of those showed himself and burnt the city and so marched forth and ascended by beth uh, so this is when he's going to work uh, making his way up to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem at this time was going through the Feast of Tabernacles. This is when the Most High gather his people, right? The Feast of Tabernacles is when the Most High tabernacle with his people in a gathering setting, right? So look at the spiritual aspect and look what's happening physically. So now, the Jews, they're supposed to be going through the Feast of Tabernacles. They violate their Sabbath day to go fight, right? Although the Sabbath was the day to which they had the greatest regard. But that rage which made them forget 
the religious observation of the Sabbath made them too hard for their enemies in the fight. With such violence, therefore, did they fall upon the Romans as to break into their ranks and to march through the midst of them, making a great slaughter as they went. Right? So we're going to read that a little bit. Uh, let's see here. Let's see, yeah, let me know how we found. Hold on, let me make sure I'm in the right one. Five seventeen. Hold on, hold on, let me get this right. Okay, bet, 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 bet. I was just, that, that's just to uh, show you about them breaking the Sabbath day. My bad. So then we're going to go down to six. So this is Cestius right here, right? And now it was a horrible, uh, this is um, section six of the same book. And now it was that a horrible fear seized upon the seditious, insomuch that many of them ran out of the city as though it were to be taken immediately. But the people upon this took courage, and where the wicked part of the city gave ground, thither did they come in order to set open the gates and to meet Cestius as their benefactor, who had uh, he been continued to siege a little longer, had certainly taken the city. But it was, I suppose, owing to the aversion God had already at the city and the sanctuary that he was hindered from putting an end to the war that very day. It had happened that Cestius was not conscious either how the besieged despaired of his, of his success nor how, how courageous the people were for him. So he recalled his soldiers from the place and by despairing of any expectation of taking it without having received any disgrace, he retired from the city without any reason in the world but when the robbers perceived this unexpected retreat of his they resumed their courage and ran after the hinder the hinder or the hinder parts of his army and destroyed a considerable a considerable number of both their horsemen and footmen and now Cestius lay all night at the camp which was at Scopius so now what happened was Cestius this is Josephus he was there he said that Cestius the Roman general he would have in fact taken the city he would have destroyed the city and taken it. But for some unknown reason, nobody know, but for some unknown reason, he stopped his siege, he turned around, and he had all of his soldiers to retreat. So without any reason, he, he did this. So the wicked people of Jerusalem took this as an advantage to follow behind him to destroy or to finish the war or continue the war but those people inside of Jerusalem that listened to Christ, guess what they did? They fled into the mountains. They left. And this is found in some of the church fathers. This is what some of the church fathers said. Now, uh, you know, I'm not really a big church fathers fan, but for historical stuff like this, I see why they can grasp that. This was the perfect opportunity for Jerusalem, Jerusalem to be surrounded by armies and for the armies to leave out just long enough for those inside of Jerusalem to get out of there and flee into the mountains, flee outside of Judea. So this was the perfect opportunity right there. So now, uh, let's go back to some scriptures. Let's go back to scripture. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 10. We're going to read 21 through 23. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father to the child. And the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. 
and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, that ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So he told the disciples about this thing that they was going to look at, right? Uh, about how they was going to be persecuted and how they was going to see a time where brothers, where family members killed each other, where kinsmen were killing each other. And then he segue and say, you guys are going to be hated for my name's sake. And while you are fleeing during this tribulation period, before your fleeing is over with, the son of man will become the son of man will have his kingdom he will have his throne that will be the end that will be judgment day this is what he's saying so he gave them this the first century not the 21st century not our time period i know you guys want it to be our time period it is not so now the brother shall deliver up brother and etc family members killing family members right so now let's show you that in history we're going to go to let me find it in my heart back first we're going to go to war of the jews sorry listen let's go here war of the jews book four contained the interval about one year from the siege of gamala to the coming of Titus to besiege Jerusalem. War of the Jews, book 4, chapter 6. How the Zealots, when they were freed from the Idumeans, slew a great many more of the citizens, and how Vespasian, uh, dis, uh, dis, what's that? Disaged the Romans when they were very uh, earnest to march against the Jews from proceeding in the war at the time. And we're going to go to section 1. And we're going to read lines 353 through uh, 362. Let me see what that looks like. 352 is... That's going to be the beginning, I believe. 353, sorry. Yep, through 362. Yep, okay, I got it right here. So this is for my people who think the Aldumians are the Romans, which is absolutely incorrect. We have historical documentation that proves the Edomites are not the Romans. I don't know why our people don't read our history, but they believe anything that sounds good. So no, the Romans were not the Edomites. In fact, the Romans fought against the Edomites in Jerusalem as well as the Israelites fought against the Edomites in Jerusalem the Edomites were not the Romans or the Idumeans were not the Romans let me say I don't care what the book of Jasher tell you once again I don't care what the book of Jasher created by some Jewish man in the 1800s told you the Idumeans were not the Romans so now right here the Idumeans complied with this persuasions and in the first place they set those that were in the prisons at liberty being about 2,000 of the populace now if you don't understand what happened during some of the war uh, the zealots was going from city to city these are descendants of uh, the southern kingdom they were going uh, from city to city uh, causing ruckus and stuff but anyway so the Romans started taking over uh, territories so they got the Idumeans to come in and help fight with them to be on their side and etc but you had some rebellion inside of jerusalem so the zealots had the idumeans to come help with those rebellious those rebellions inside of jerusalem in order to get everybody on the same page but the idumeans actually uh took over for a set for uh for a little moment until the zealots on those was able to break free but anyway so now who thereupon fled away immediately to uh simon one whom we shall speak of presently, after which these Idumeans retired from Jerusalem and went home, which departure of theirs was a great surprise to both parties. For the people, not knowing of their repentance, pulled up their, cor their courage for a while as ease of so many of their enemies, while the zealots grew more insolent, not as deserted 
by their confederates, but as freed from such men as might hinder their designs and plant some stop to their wickedness. Accordingly, they made no longer any delay, nor took any liberations in their enormous practices, but made use of the shortest methods for all their executions, and what they had once resolved upon, they put in practice sooner than any could imagine. All right, let me see how far I'm going to go down. I'm going down to 362. So, not Okay. But their thirst was chiefly after the blood of violent men of, and men of good family. So, these are the Jews killing each other inside of Jerusalem. The one sort of which they destroyed out of envy, the other out of fear. For they thought their whole security lay in leaving no potent men alive, on which account they slew Gorion, a person eminent in dignity, and on account of his family also. He was also for democracy, and of a great boldness and freedom of spirit, as were of any of the Jews, whosoever the principal thing that ruined him. Added to other disadvantages was his free speaking. So we have it right, hold on, so when this Niger, okay, so nor did Niger or Paris escape their hands. He had been a man of great valor in their war with the Romans. You see how they're making the difference between Romans and Idumeans, but was not drawn through the middle of the city, and he went, as he went, he frequently cried out and showed the scars of his wounds. And when he was drawn out of the gates and despaired of his preservation, he besought them to grant him a burial. But as they had threatened him beforehand, not to grant him any spot of earth for a grave, which he chiefly desired of them. So they did slay him without permitting him to be buried. Now when they were slaying him, he made this imprecation upon them that they might undergo both famine and pestilence in war. Ain't that what Christ told them? There's going to be wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences. And, and, and Well, I'm going to show you that after we get done with this. And besides all of that, they might come to the mutual slaughter of one another, as which imprecations God confirmed against these impious men and was that came most justly upon them when not long afterward they tasted of their own madness and their mutual seditions once one against another so when this niger was killed i think that was it oh yeah that was it right there to show you now eventually those inside of jerusalem start killing them own their own selves they will start killing their own family members and stuff because they're all kinsmen right so now, you go back into what Christ told them. This is how powerful Christ is. He told them about the brother delivering up brother to death and the father the child and the children should rise against their parents and cause them to be put to death, right? And then in Matthew 24, dealing with this same war, it's the same war, he said, um, nation should rise against nations, kingdom against kingdom. There should be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So we're seeing this being displayed inside of the war of the Jews that happened in first century. But we're not done with that, right? Um, let's see where we at. We're going to go to section three now. Let's see what we got here in three. Okay, we're going to go in section three now. And we're going to read three, all of three. All right. Or should I skip around? All right, it'd be better if I read all of it. So now we're reading all of three, first century. And now the commanders join in their approbation of what Vespasian had said, and it was soon discovered how wise an opinion he had given. And indeed, many there were of the Jews that had deserted every day and fled away from the Zealots. So the Zealots were those of the southern kingdom, other Jews. The Zealots was a part of the Jews. So you got the Jews running from each other 
inside of Jerusalem in the first century dealing with the war of Jews. Although their flight was very difficult since they had guarded every passage out of the city. So the zealots had the city blocked where those inside of Jerusalem could not get out. So the Jews blocked the Jews from getting out. Right? So now let's keep reading. And slew everyone that was caught at them as taking it for granted they were going over to the Romans. Yet did he who gave them money get clear off while he only that gave them none was voted a traitor. So the upshot was this, that the rich purchased their their flight by money while none but the poor were slain along remember the poor was the kingdom of heaven they was going to get the kingdom of heaven along all the roads also vast number of dead bodies lay in heaps and even many of those that were so zealous in deserting at length chose rather to perish within the city see this is that uh, let me let me show you what I what I'm what I'm reading right now, just in case you guys don't uh, get how prophecy worked. This is what I'm reading right here. I'm reading Matthew 24 about the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman army, and this is what I'm reading right here. Um, Matthew 24:21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor nor ever shall be. And then you got this coming from Daniel, because this is what he put him from Daniel 12 and 1. And at this time, Michael shall stand up the great prince, which stand for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as was not since there was never was since there was a nation to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone found written in the book. So this is about Rome destroying Jerusalem. This is all this is. Rome destroying Jerusalem. So, the time of tribulation, Jacob's trouble, this is what we're reading right now. Jacob's trouble. And he said, what did he say about Jacob's trouble or the uh, this tribulation period? He said, and except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So now we're reading why uh, those days needed to be shortened, and etc. So inside of Jerusalem, dealing with that war, you got Rome. You saw you got the Israelites, the Jews, killing each other inside of the city. And then we got something going on outside of the city too, which we're going to read in just a second. For the hopes of burial made death in their own city appear of the two less terrible to them. So you remember it said. Uh, the dead bodies was going to be there and it's like people was going to be buried for seven years and etc and this is why because they wasn't allowed to bury anybody during this war but these zealots came at last to that degree of barbarity as not to bestow a burial either on those slain in the city or on those that lay along the roads but as if they had made an agreement to counsel both the laws of their country and the laws of nature. And at that same time, they that defiled men with their wicked actions, they would pollute the divinity itself also. They left the dead bodies to putrefy under the sun. And the same punishment was allotted was allotted to such as buried any as to those that deserted. So you see what's going on inside of Jerusalem by the Jews. I know they want you to believe that this is going to happen our time period and the the evil Edomites or whoever they want Edomites to be, because we see right now is not the Romans, but they want the evil people to be the ones that's doing all of this stuff to the good people. Oh, these are the evil people doing this to the Jews and the Lord going to come save us. No. These were in the past time, <clears throat> these were the Jews doing it to the Jews because of the judgment by the Messiah. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Which was no other than death. While he that granted the favor of grave of a grave to another would presently stand in need of a grave himself. To say all in a word. No other gentle passion was so entirely lost among them as mercy. 
For what were the greatest objects of pity did most of all irritate these wretches? And they transferred their rage from the living to those that had been slain, and from the dead to the living. Nay, the terror was so great. Remember, Josephus was there. He saw all of this. He, re he, re he recorded it. That he who survived called them that were first dead happy as being at rest already. As, uh, hold on, hold on. That is, that is, uh, hold on, hold on. Let me see that. That is, let me, let me show you. That is, what's that, Luke 19? Hold on, let me see here. Hold on. Twenty-three, twenty-eight, uh, twenty-three, twenty-seven, and there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turned unto them, said, "Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children, for behold, the days are coming, in which they shall say." Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the palps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? So you see, they are saying, for everybody that don't got kids, they were blessed. In other words, the people that is already dead, right? Telling the mountains fall on us, cover us from the wrath. What's going on? It's a lot of tribulation going on inside of Jerusalem. So the people are actually happy for the women that have never gave birth to children. You know, children was, a, was an awesome thing back in the in the ancient Eastern world. So now they're saying, blessed are the ones that 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 are bare, that don't have children. Um, blessed are the dead. Because they don't have to go through this now. So let's let's go back into um, what's going on. Nay, the terror was so great that he who survived called them that were very first dead happy, as being at rest already. As did those that were under torture in the prisons declared that upon this comparison, those that lay unburied were the happiest. These men therefore trampled upon all the laws of men and laughed at the laws of God. And for the oracles of the prophets, they ridiculed them as the tricks of jugglers. So now you see, these are those of Israelite descent. These are those of the Jew race. What were they doing? They were the one laughing at the laws of men, first of all, the laws of this other city. Then they laughed at the laws of God. They laughed at whatever was going on in the law of Moses. And then they laughed at the oracles of the prophets, which was the prophecies about the destruction of the city and that final judgment, that day of the Lord. They laughed at all of that, and they ridiculed them as tricks of jugglers. Yet did these prophets foretell many things concerning the rewards of virtue and the punishments of vice, which when these zealots violated, 
they occasioned the fulfilling of those very prophecies belonging to their own country. For there was a certain ancient oracle of those men that the city should be taken and the sanctuary burnt by right of war when a sedition should invade the Jews and their own hand should pollute the temple of God. Now, while these zealots did not quite disbelieve these, predition, these predictions, they made themselves the, the instruments of their accomplishment. So now, you got to see Josephus is reading from an older Torah. He has an older Torah. He has the uh, ancient uh, oral, uh, uh, oral tradition. So his Torah don't read like the Masoretes that we got today or the Septuagint that we have available to us today. So in the Torah that he had, he said uh, there was the city should be taken and the sanctuary burnt by right of war when the sedition should invade the Jews and their own hand should pollute the temple of God. So it we don't have nothing in our prophets, right, that has those exact words, but we got something uh close to it and notice Josephus said that that was being fulfilled in his time period this is very important so this oracle that Josephus is saying is being that was being fulfilled this oracle that he's talking about is actually being fulfilled in the first century in his time period so all we got to do is find the oracle now we don't have it written exactly like he have it written but we have the oracle and the oracle is Daniel chapter 9 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make re reconciliation for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up vision and prophecy no more vision and prophecy everybody and to know it the most holy this is the fulfillment of the bible no more vision no more prophecy no more of that you know i know you guys think you guys are prophet today as i know i know y'all still seeing prophecies i know y'all think israel is going to do something else i know y'all come in with a million reasons why we doing feast days and fringes and prophecies and this and that day of the lords this and that 70 weeks that was going to seal up the vision and prophecy no more vision and prophecy y'all so now this is what he said happened this is daniel 9:26. And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So whatever Josephus, Josephus is pulling from this Daniel prophecy right here. So this is about. Israel on Israel. The war, this is about Israel stuff. So the prince that shall come and destroy the city with a flood, right? That could be Rome, but it also could be Israel. I, we don't know if some of this prophecy got left off or not, or the Masoretic, uh changed the prophecy around. The way that it's read is talking about Rome coming in and destroying the city, per se. But Josephus said that the Jews at their own hand was going to destroy the city. So this has got to be what that's about. So either some of the stuff is left out, or it's a twofold prophecy or something. But regardless, this happened first century. So if this happened first century, the abomination of desolation happened first century. And if the abomination of desolation happened first century, the tribulation happened first century. And if the tribulation happened first century, the Antichrist came first century. And if the Antichrist came first century, the end of the tribulation happened first century. And if the end of the tribulation happened first century, the Son of Man came with the clouds at first century. And if the Son of Man came with was supposed to come with clouds on the first century, surely somebody would have said it. Well, once you go to Matthew 24 and 34, 
Verily I say unto you, he's talking to the disciples, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So Christ literally did tell the disciples their generation was going to be the generation where everything he said in Matthew 24 was going to be fulfilled. So no matter what kind of futuristic idea, ideology that people have, talking about it's coming and the antichrist is the pope or whatever the, the coronavirus is the mark of the beast or whatever you guys do with the scripture christ said everything was going to happen his uh time period his generation which was first century first century and we're reading josephus actually saying these oracles were fulfilled first century so now let's keep let's keep going Let's keep going to some historical documents, uh, this historical information that uh, Josephus gave us, since he experienced it firsthand. So, uh, where are we at now? Uh, this 8, what's the 817? Uh, we're going to go now to Force 3, hold on, Force 6. 377 to okay, we just read that. Hold on, 353. Got to read 53 through. Hold on, and that was Matthew 24 27 through 28. Oh, yeah, my bad. So then you see uh, all of the dead people, right. So they said, you know, there were dead people everywhere. They could not bury the dead people and et cetera, right? Bodies throughout the city, bodies in the road. Um, that's also Matthew 24. Um, 27. For as lightning coming out of the east and shining into the west, so shall uh, also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will be the eagles there will the eagles be gathered together. So you got the carcasses laid everywhere, right? And we're going to see the gathering of the eagle uh, later on. So now, let's go, let's venture off into some more scriptures to show you that this day of the Lord, the day of Christ, was first century, not 21st century. And we don't have to flee. We can be at ease. Because the day of the Lord brought in the end of the old covenant, the beginning of the new covenant, brought in the end of the law of Moses, brought in the new law of faith through Christ. So now, let's go to, I don't know you guys don't like that. That sounds like Christian stuff. Well, if it's Christian stuff, obviously Christians got it right because that's what the Bible teaches. So now, let's look at more of the history to show you what's going on in the Bible, just in case you guys don't believe this happened first century. We're going to read Revelation 16, 3 through 6. And the second angel poured out his vow upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul in the, died in the sea. So what you don't know what's going on here, uh, the book of Revelation is going through the events that happened during that final war with uh, with the Romans. So that's all the book of Revelation is about. The final war against the Romans. I know they want you to be it to be about today dealing with Russia or China, America. I know that's what they want it to be, but that's not what it is. It's about the the prophecy that Christ gave about Jerusalem being destroyed by the Romans in the day of the Lord. That's all Revelation is about. So this is Revelation 16 and 3. And the second angel poured out of his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. This is taking us back to Egypt, the plagues in Egypt. So now, mystery Egypt would be uh, Judea, what's going on in Judea. Mystery Egypt will be what's going on in Judea uh, surrounding Jerusalem. And I'm going to show you. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the river and fountains of water, and they became blood. Uh, I'm going to read to, let me mark down so I don't lose my spot. I'm going to read down to verse 6. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and which was and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So now, who's getting this blood to drink? 
who shed the blood of saints and prophets? Mystery Babylon, right? This is going against Mystery Babylon. So, according to Christ, let's go back to Christ's words. Uh, Matthew 23. Matthew 23 and... 34, wherefore behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men, and scribes. Some of them you should kill and crucify, and some of them you should scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city. Dead upon you may come all of the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel and the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you slew between the altar and the temple, or the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things should come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killest the prophets and stoned them that are sent unto thee. So this was something that was going to happen first century to Jerusalem. They the one who killed the prophets and the saints, and all the blood of the righteous was going to come upon their head. So now this is what's happening in Revelation 6 and 6, 16 and 6. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and they have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So he's, he's doing, Christ is doing, where he told the scribes and Pharisees he was going to do their generation. He's coming through with, he's proven that he's a prophet. He, the prophecy, the prophet is going like he said he was going to go, proven that he is a prophet. So now, let me show you what that looks like in history. So we see what it looks like in vision form. So now let's see what it looked like in history. Uh, so we go back to the War of the Jews again. War of the Jews. We're going to go to book four. Sorry. War of the Jews. Book four. Containing the interval of about one year from the siege of Gamala to the coming of Titus to besiege Jerusalem. All first century stuff. War of the Jews. Book four. Chapter seven. How John uh, tyrann, uh, tyrannized over the rest and what mischief the zealots did at Masada. How also Vespasian took Gadara and what action were performed by Placidus. Okay, so we got chapter 7, uh, section 6. Alright, so section 6 right there. And I'm just going to read it. So this is when uh, they were at, as far as Jordan, this is the Jews, right? The whole army was with them, blah, blah, this and that. Now, this destruction that f fell upon the Jews, as it was not inferior to any of the rest in itself. So did it still appear greater than it really was? And this, because not only the whole country through which they fled was filled with slaughter and Jordan could not be passed over by reason of the dead bodies that were in it but because the lake as uh, as fault as as falterous uh, as falterous I guess as, as falterous was also full of dead bodies they were carried down into it by the river and now Placidus, after this good success that he f had, fell viol violently upon the neighboring small city, smaller cities and villages when he took Abila and Julius and Belzimoth and all, that, all those that lay as far as the lake as Faltitus, uh, whatever, and put, the, uh, put such of those deserters into each of them that he thought proper. He then put his soldiers on board the ships and slew such as had fled to the lake, insomuch that all Perea had either surrendered themselves or were taken by the Romans as far as Mount Jerus. So now you have it recorded that the uh, dealing with Jordan, right? The river Jordan, etc., had so many dead bodies in it that no one could pass over it, right? These are the neighboring uh, 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 places where those Israelites were at. So, you have it here in Revelation, once again. Us, in a sense, uh, the third angel poured out his vial upon rivers and fountains of waters. So you had the sea affected, you had rivers affected, and all fountains of waters. 
And what happened? <clears throat> Every living soul died in the sea. So all of that was due to judgment, right? <clears throat> and you can see it right here. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thou judgments. So now, let's show you something else. Let's go to Revelation 17, 16. This is all about the Babylon, uh, 17, 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest, make it unto, uh, sawest unto the beast, these shall hate the whore, mystery Babylon, uh, Jerusalem, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So now, what was supposed to be desolate? Luke 21. What was supposed to be desolate? And when Jerusalem can pass with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Jerusalem was supposed to be desolate. You see that in Daniel 9. Uh, Daniel 9. What's that? For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, which is the time of the end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. They shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and to the end of the war, desolations are determined. So all of this was supposed to be about the desolation of Jerusalem, not America or whatever people tell y'all today. This is the last of uh, war that Jerusalem ever had to go through, deal with the Romans, that dealt with a curse from the law of Moses and etc. All the old covenant. So now, he should make her desolate, uh, naked, should eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Right? Uh, you go to War of the Jews. Hold on, let's go there. War of the Jews. Book 5. Book five, uh, containing the interval of the next six months from the coming of Titus to besiege Jerusalem to the great extremity to which the Jews were reduced. All first century. Chapter one, concerning the seditions at Jerusalem and what terrible miseries afflicted the city by their means. Uh, section one and uh, round verse three. Let me see. Let me find it real fast in my heart bound. Alrighty, and we're going to go to All right, right here. I guess I could read all of it. When therefore Titus had marched over that desert which lies between Egypt and Syria, in the manner forementioned, he came to Caesarea having resolved to set his forces in order at the place before he began the war. Nay, indeed, while he was assisting his father his father at Alexandria, which was in Egypt, in settling that government which had been ne uh, newly conferred upon them by God, it so happened that the sedition at Jerusalem was revived and parted into three factions. That's the, three, that's the city breaking into three right there. And that one faction fought against the other, that's the man against man, which partition in such evil cases may be said to be a good thing and the effect of divine justice. Now as to attack the zealots, now as to the attack the zealots made upon the people, and which I esteem at the beginning of the city's destruction, it have been already explained after the accurate manner. As also whence it arose and to how a great mischief it was increased. But for the present sedition, one should not mistake if he called it a sedition, but guided by another sedition, and to be like a wild beast grown mad, which for want of food from abroad fell now upon eating its own flesh. So you see the imagery right there. It was like a beast that got real hungry and started eating its own flesh, right? And we have similar language in uh, Revelation and the ten horns that saw, it upon, uh, saw upon the beast shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire and eventually we learn that this is what's happening 
inside the city to itself. So now, uh, y'all only got uh, a few more left. And we're going to read uh, four. Let's say four. Okay, five. Four. Give me one second. I didn't, I didn't take a good note with this one. Give me one sec, y'all. I don't know what kind of uh, what. I'm gonna get ready to start. Something about these notes that I was trying to say. Let's see here: twenty-seven to thirty-one. Okay, four. Okay, I got it now. Four, twenty-six. Twenty-two through twenty-six. All right, so I got it. All right, so we're gonna read four, twenty-two, and there now. I'm gonna read five. Book five, chapter one, section four. I was there, right there. Yeah, I don't know why I just did it. And we're going to read, and now he did. All right. Right here. Sorry about that, y'all. I kind of confused myself with my own notes, but I got it now. So now, and now, there were three treacherous factions in the city. One parted from the other. Eleazar and his party, and kept the sacred, uh, that kept the sacred first fruits, came against John in their cup. Those who, uh, those that were with John plundered the populace and went out uh, with the zeal against Simon. Let's see how far I'm going to go now. All the way. All right. This Simon had his supply of provisions from the city in opposition to the seditious. When therefore John was assaulted on both sides, he made his men turn about, throwing his darts upon those citizens that came up against him from the cloisters he had in his position, while he opposed those that attacked him from the temple by his engines of war. And if any at any time he was freed from those that were above him, which happened frequently from being drunk and tired. He sallied out with a great number upon Simon and his party. And this he did always in such parts of the city as he could at, till he set on fire those houses that were full of corn and all other provisions. So this is what's happening right here. So he set the, uh, the houses full of corn and all other provisions on fire. The same thing was done by Simon. When upon the other retreats, he attacked the city also, as if they had on purpose done it to serve the Romans. 
by destroying what the city had laid up against the siege and thus cutting off the nerves of their power. Accordingly, it so came to pass that all the places that were about the temple were burnt down and were become an intermediate uh, desert space, ready for fighting on both sides of it, and that almost all the corn was burnt, which would have been sufficient for a siege of many years. So they were taken by the means of the famine, which it was impossible that they should have been, unless they had thus prepared the way for it by this procedure. So what Josephus said was, they had plenty of food, but the fighting inside of Jerusalem is the reason why the food was taken away. They set the corn on fire. So that corn being set on fire, it took away all of the food inside that was supposed to last for a long time. And this is why when Christ told them it was going to be a famine, you know how far-fetched it sound when just like what happened by uh, Joseph, uh, they already had making provisions for uh, the famine. So they like famine. It ain't going to be a famine. We got plenty of food. But you can see that through div divine judgment, uh, they actually uh, burnt up their own food, creating their own famine, right? And this is what Christ said, that there was going to be famines in the land. And now I'm going to read down to 31. And now, as the city was engaged in a war on all sides from these treacherous crowds of wicked men, the people of the city between them were like a great body torn in pieces. So now, inside of Jerusalem, there were war on all sides. So you got the Roman army on the outside. They got it surrounded, which is what Christ said. Uh, they're going to surround... Uh, uh, when he was weeping over the city. Uh, so you got the Roman army surrounding it on the outside, and you got the Jews on the inside fighting. The aged men and the women were in such distress by their internal calamities that they wished for the Romans and earnestly hoped for an external war in order to their delivery from their domestical miseries. You see why the, you see why the war had to be end quickly he said uh if the war would not end quickly no flesh would be saved but for the elect's sake uh the war that that tribulation period didn't last that long this you see why they was killing everybody the citizens there themselves were under a terrible consternation and fear nor had themselves sorry nor had they any opportunity of taking counsel and of changing their conduct nor were there any hopes of coming to an agreement with their enemies, nor could such, a, such as had a mind flee away. For guards were set at all places, and the heads of the robbers, although they were seditious one against another in other respects, yet did they agree in killing those that were for peace with the Romans, or were suspected of an inclination to desert them as their common enemies, and agreed in nothing but this, to kill those that were innocent. The noise also of those that were fighting was incessant, both by day and by night, but the lamentations of those that mourned exceeded the other, nor was there any was there ever any occasion for them to leave off their lamentations because of their calamities came perpetually one upon another, although the deep consternation they were in were in prevented their outward welling, but being constrained by their fear to conceal their inward passions, they were in, inwardly tormented without daring to open their lips in groans. You see, this is what a time of tribulation looks like. Okay, that's what tribulation looks like. That's what Christ was warning them about. A, a time of tribulation so ne such ne never was uh, to that time, neither never shall be again. So now, chapter 2 now, book 5, chapter 2. And y'all, I'm almost done. I got 1, 2, 3, 4, like 5 more. How Titus marched to Jerusalem and how he was in danger as he was taken a view of the, city, uh, of the city of the place also where he pitched his camp. Alright, so we're going to read War of the Jews, book 5, chapter 2, section 1, and we're just going to read uh, 48 
two, section one. One sec. All these came, yeah. All these came before the engines. And after these engines came the tribunes. Or the, uh, is it supposed to be, yeah. The tribunes. And the leader of the cut horse with their select bodies. And after these came the ensigns with the eagle. So you got the eagle coming now, right? With the carcass eel, the eagle will be there also. And before those ensigns came to came the trumpeters belonging to them. So now you got the people who blasting the trumpets, right? Remember, it's going to be seven trumpet blasts, right? And at the, the seven trumpet, uh, everything was going to be done. So you see now you got the Romans who's bringing in the trumpeters. So you got Jerusalem who got the trumpets, and you got the Romans who got the trumpets. So they're uh, uh, blowing the trumpets, dealing with the war. This is the, the, the war of the Jews, the day of the Lord, right? So now, let's get ready to uh, get ready to uh, land, land this plane. Let's get ready to land this plane now. All right, so we're going to go back. Let's go to Revelation 16, 21. And you see right here, And every island fled away, the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So you got the uh, the stone coming, right? The stone coming down, and we see the stone happened in Daniel. It struck the uh, the foot, and it destroyed the whole uh, um, statue. But now you have something uh, similar, and there fell upon a men a great hell out of heaven about the weight of a talent, right? So this is a stone about the weight of a talent that came out of heaven, which represents what happened in uh, Daniel 2. A stone coming, uh, not made by hand, struck the, uh, the the foot and it broke everything into pieces. So this is what that's piggybacking off of. But let me show you what that looks like in history. So you got War of the Jews, book five, Chapter 6. Let me see what chapter I'm in right now. I'm in chapter 3. Let's see if we can go to chapter 6. I went now too far. Forget it. Book 5. Chapter 6. Concerning the tyrant Simon and John. How also, as Titus was going around the wall of the city, Nicanor was wounded by a dart, which accident provoked Titus to press on the siege. Section 3. Around 269 and 70. And your heart bound is page 851. And we're going to start at now these. Now those that were all right, right here. Now, those that were at work covered themselves with hurdles spread over their banks, and their engines were opposed to them when they made their excursions. The engines that all the legions had ready prepared for them were admir admirably contrived, but still more extraordinary ones belonged to the 10th legion. Those that threw darts and those that threw stones were more forcible than, and larger than the rest, by which they not only repelled the excursion of the Jews, but drove those away that were upon the walls also. Now the stones that were cast were the weight of a talent and were carried two furlongs and further. The blow they gave was no way to be sustained, not only by those that stood first in the way, but those that were beyond them for a great space. As, hold on. So you have right here, well, I'm going to read all of it, and then I'm going to keep going. As for the Jews, they at first watched the coming of the stone, for it 
was of white color. So now notice this description right here. The stone was of white color and could therefore not only be perceived by a great noise it made, but could be seen also before it came by its brightness. So you got a stone, look like it's coming from heaven. It's, it's white and it's bright. Accordingly, the watchmen that sat upon the towers gave them notice when the engine was let go, and the stone came from it and cried, uh, and the stone came from it and cried out aloud in their own country language the stone cometh so those that were in it in its way stood off and threw themselves down to the ground by which means by their thus guarding themselves the stone fell down and did them no harm so now here and, and, I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna show you something in just a second but notice Notice what happened. This stones that was coming from heaven, how much did it weigh? It was the weight of a talent. It was the weight of a talent. Now, what happened in the book of Revelation? And there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven, every stone, about the weight of a talent. So you can't get no more clearer than that. But let me show you something. There it said the uh, the the stone coming right. Let's see if you can see it right here. Ah, you can't see it. Yeah, you can't see it. Ah, that's messed up. Will you focus? anyway here uh, here it said it actually said the sun I think you can see that sun a little bit right there if I do that right there S-O-N can you see it a little bit the sun cometh so when they looked at it it was bright it was white it came out of heaven and they screamed out, the sun cometh. Now, uh, I know it says stone here, but it's the sun cometh in mind that I got. It says, uh, I got a note here in my, uh, in my book. It says, what should be the meaning of the signal or watchword? When the watchman saw a stone coming from the engine, the sun cometh. Or what mistake there is in the reading? I cannot tell. The MSS, both Greek and Latin, all agree in this uh, in this reading, and I cannot approve of any groundless conjecture or alteration of the text from Hausas to Hausas, that not the sun or a stone, but that the arrow or dart coming, and has been made by Dr. Husson and not corrected by uh, Haverkamp, had Josephus written even his first edition of these books in the war in pure Hebrew or Jew, uh, Joseph wrote a form edition of Jews, Euphrates. In other words, he's saying that uh, the sun is the correct rendering right there. That's what he's saying. So they actually said the sun coming, right? The son of man, right? So it's actually just giving you a reference, right? So the son of man coming, and when the son of man cometh, he came looking uh well it's it's symbolic let me let me get you here it's symbolic so the son of man coming because instead of here it says the stone coming here but in mine it says the sun coming and it gives you a symbolism because remember earlier he said on whatever this stone fall upon is broke to dust right and then in daniel 2 we have a stone coming out of heaven uh, that breaks the statue into pieces, right? So here we have a stone about the weight of a talent, just like Josephus, I mean, just like Revelation said. And that stone, uh, it came from heaven. It was white in color and it was bright. Very symbolic, wasn't it? For the son of man's um, judgment. All right. So that's pretty much a correlated judgment right there. 
So now we're going to get ready to end it with this right here. Luke 21 20. Well, we can read 20 through 22. Uh, I said Luke 20. One, twenty through twenty-two. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let those which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that's the day of the Lord, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. That's the end of all prophecies. All prophecies would end with this judgment. But woe to them that are with child to them to get suck in those days, for there should be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. That wrath was the day of the Lord. What did John say to the Sadducees and the Pharisees? Who warned y'all to flee from the wrath to come? See, the, uh, what did Christ tell his disciples? Uh, when you see Jerusalem by, uh, come past with armies, flee into the mountains. So the, the, the followers, the, the repentant ones, got warned to flee from the wrath but those wicked people wasn't supposed to uh, learn to uh, flee from the wrath they wasn't supposed to uh, repent destruction was was designated for them so John told them asked them who warned them to flee from the wrath meanwhile Christ told his disciples to flee from the wrath and you see that this is the wrath. This is the day of the Lord. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captain to all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles in the time of the, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. According to uh, uh, Daniel, they shall only last 1,335 days after the abomination of desolation was set up. So now, so we got everything being fulfilled right there, right? And then we go to Luke uh, 19, 41 through 44. And he said, he asked the sentence of them, I tell you this, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least at this day, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. For the day should come upon thee, that thine enemy should cast a trench about thee, encompass thee around and keep thee in on every side and they shall lay thee even with the ground and, and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knew was not the time of thy visitation that visitation was the time of the visitation of the Lord the day of the Lord so he's crying because of the day of the Lord that was approaching Jerusalem within uh, those 40 years Right within 40 years, and we have that actually. In we're gonna end it with this one. War of the Jews, Book Four, Chapter Nine. Vespasian had taken. Uh, that Vespasian, after he had taken Gadara, made preparation for the siege of Jerusalem, but that upon his hearing of the death of Nero, he changed his intentions as concerning Simon of Geras. And we're going to go to page 824. And we're going to read uh, section uh, line 490. And it says, and now the war have gone through. We find it right here. right here. And now the war had, and now the war having gone through all of the mountainous country. That's why those in Judea had to flee into the mountains because it was going to affect all Judea and all the plain country. Also, those that were at Jerusalem were deprived of the liberty of going out of the city. For as to such as had a mind to desert, they were watched by the zealots. And as to so, and as to such as were not yet on the side of the Romans, their, own, their army kept them in. 
by encompassing the city round about on all sides. So you have it right there, direct correlation. Right there. And uh, for the day should come on thee, and thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side. So this happened between, how long? So this happened uh, in the first century. You see them compass being compassed around about and kept in on every side by the zealots, the Jews inside, and the Romans on the outside. They was compassed around every side. But that destruction, that compassing around on every side, what, what happened? Revelation 19, when Jerusalem, sorry, Revelation 20, when Jerusalem is being destroyed, right? What was the hope for the people? 2019, and they went into the bread, sorry, verse 2018, and shall go, well, And when the thousand years expired, Satan shall be loosened out of his prison. So this is the time of thousand years, not literal, is the time when the gospel was reigning. Uh, they bring in the church, they build in the church, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is the sand of the sea. So this is uh, those from uh, the Roman army coming in to surround Jerusalem and to battle Jerusalem. And they went up on the bread of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints round about. So you got them compassing inside of Jerusalem. I mean, outside of Jerusalem, you got the zealots inside of Jerusalem, and what happened? And the, and the beloved city. So they camped the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Uh, that fire was in the form of A. Um, remember, this is all about the fire coming out of the, the mouth. Where the mouth, right? And fire should shoot from their mouth. And he will fight them with a sword from his mouth, and etc. So this fire come, coming down represents the word right and them fleeing into the mountains allowed them to survive everybody else got devoured by the devoured by the fire right so look and they went up to the bread of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city and fire came down out of god out of heaven and devoured them so this is all just another way of saying that those that listen to christ was saved through the Holy Spirit and they fled into the mountains. Meanwhile, everybody else that got left in the city was devoured by fire. And this includes, you know, the Rome took some, uh, they took a, a hit too on their end. So everybody, like, had to go through it. Rome went through it on their side as well as the Jews. It's just Rome won the war because that was the uh, decision by Christ. So now, Woo, we are done with the day of the Lord. So, the question is, do we flee, do we retreat, or do we stay at ease and be in peace? I tell you now, we, st keep, we stay at ease, be in peace. The day of the Lord that came, biblical-wise, dealt with the end of the old covenant there's no day of the lord needed for the new covenant no more nations being punished per se the wicked people are being punished now if the wicked people are together it's sort of like a nation being punished but that's not saying though the father is done with judgment a righteous king always rule righteously so the wicked have to be punished because they're outside of the heavenly kingdom which is inside and uh, the righteous people don't have to worry about the punishment, right? They are saved and, and sanctified.
judgment for individuals. There's still judgment in the new heavens and the new earth inside of us, as well as you know our terrain. But um, I am done with that. That's me, Evan Israel, from the day of the Lord. Right. So two hours and forty-four minutes. I ain't did it in a while. This is my channel, A-O-S-D-C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R. Also, I'm an instructor of RPK. You type in RPK uh, in your search bar, type in the words resurrection, prophecy, and kingdom. Look at that emblem pop up. 55 subscribers we need way more subscribers and you see it uh, click the subscribe and the bell RPK you see we have plenty of different videos on different subjects right here uh, we're dealing with uh, resurrection prophecy and kingdom those are the three subjects that we master subject of resurrection subject of prophecy subject of kingdom uh, if you, I believe these are the three tenets that you need to know in order to understand the Bible and what we're supposed to be doing and here at my personal channel, AOSD Chandler, it's a similar sound doctrine and Chandler. And all I'm doing People is trying try to, to give sound doctrine out. You see, plenty, plethora of videos. Just trying to give different sound doctrine out because a lot of people uh, mistake a lot of information from the ancient Hebrews. And they have this futuristic ideal that things are about our time period and our future meanwhile these things have been fulfilled in our past there's no need for nothing new under the sun uh have faith believe that you are in the kingdom and live your life in love uh we're based off of the three tenets right i'm gonna tell you the three tenets of where we're based off of and then i'm gonna uh, uh, bow out the three tenets that we're based off of can be found in first john Welcome you to welcoming you in to the new covenant, right? This is how you know. First John three twenty two, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. This ain't talking about the law of Moses or the uh, the old covenant on Mount Sinai. These are the commandments from Mount Zion, the the, the spiritual mountain where we're a part of now. So now, are based off of faith. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he has gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. So, this is our tenets that we live by in the new covenant as well as RPK. We love the Father above all. And the way that we show that we love the Father is through believing on the name of his son. Now, you can play with the name all you want to. Jesus, Yahweh, Yahweh, Shai, Yahshua. That's what you want to do. Salvation, Savior, what you want to do. But we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. That's what we do. That's our tenet. That's what we're supposed to be doing today in the new covenant. So, let's get ready to uh, leave out. I'm going to leave out on a note. Uh, a new uh, AOSD song is coming. Uh, probably the same graphic, just new lyrics. So, let's get ready to leave this on a good note. I love you all and shalom. Thank you for clicking on the channel. AOSD. Similar sound doctrine channel. A similar sound doctrine. AOSD. RPK. Resurrection from the Kingdom. Like, subscribe, share. Let's go. Oh. Come get a lesson. I'm teaching blessings. No need for guessing. I'm knowledge testing. It's truth time. The wise will shine. And the wicked will pine. I'm a righteous kind. Great out of trouble, I'm keeping the subtle. Just me and my brothers and sisters. They love us. We're fixing the puzzle. No stressing. I come to the buck of the struggle. We're we'll unseen because we're the reason. We need it. It should be back. See that? They need it. Like a kid back. Breaches and pieces.
Like the Kit Kat, I eat it, I get seasoned It's a poly world, not dolly world Alpha love, the kingdom within A-O-S-D, it's finessing On PK, let you get to begin It's a poly world, not dolly world Alpha love, the kingdom within A-O-S-D, it's finessing On PK, let you get to begin A-O-S-D, A-O-S-D A-O-S-D, A-O-S-D A-O-S-D, 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 A-O-